And we are live again. Hello, everybody. Hello, Urs. Uh, uh, it's the second time we have you on our awesome YouTube channel. Exactly. Yeah, I'm honored to be here in yeah such a short period of time. Cool Great. stuff. Cool stuff. So what are we going to do today? Uh, we have kind of part two of the previous session that Urs did with us uh, two months ago, right? Two months ago, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Time flies so fast. So in December we did this. Now we are doing it, do, doing it again. So folks uh, who are joining our session, uh, people are coming in. We have like almost 40, 45 and so on. They're incoming. Uh, folks, uh, please give uh, like ask your questions in the chat as we do the presentation. Uh, I'm going to monitor the chat. Urs is going to do the presentation and answer your questions as they come in. And I will interrupt him um, whenever it makes sense to ask your questions. Uh, otherwise, well, you know what to do. You are on YouTube channel. You're on your favorite YouTube channel about Kotlin. You Definitely. Have to subscribe, <laughs> subscribe, like, and interact with us so we, we get more exposure and we bring more love to to people who love Kotlin. Uh, with that, I guess we we can actually start. And uh, worse, it's it's all yours. And uh, let's kick it in. Excellent. Thank you for handing the stage over to me. Yeah. So this is going to be part two of uh, the session I did some months ago, where we talked about Spring Boot and coroutines. And in the introduction, we already talked a little bit about virtual threads. And we thought, hmm, maybe let's do another session and see what happens if you would add virtual threads to this particular constellation. So a very short introduction of me for the ones who haven't followed session one. Urs Peter, senior software engineer. I try to be as much possible with my hands in the dirt, writing code. The older you get, the more challenging this might be. So far, I succeed quite well. So I'm a team lead solution architect. Recently, also many stages to talk about very subject about uh, um, software development, mainly about Kotlin, also Kotlin Conf 24. I will be there with a workshop and a talk. I'm a trainer at Xib Academy where I created quite a variety of trainings. I'm also a certified Kotlin trainer where I help teams actually in all stages of the development, be beginner, intermediate, and also advanced. So also if you're an advanced Kotlin developer, there is still stuff to learn, like hopefully also today. So when you look at my career, I started out with Java, or like maybe many of us 20 years ago. Then I moved to Scala about 10 years ago. And since about five, six years, I do exclusively Kotlin. And throughout all this time, I had this fascination for concurrency. So in Java, I did low-level concurrency with wait, notify, latches, semaphores, and all these low-level building blocks. In Scala, I did a lot of reactive programming, reactive streams, the actor framework. Still uh, get a headache when I say actor framework, CKRS, and so on. And with Kotlin, did a lot of coroutine stuff. And there, actually, don't have memories of headache. So apparently, there's something, uh, it's still concurrency, but the way you do it really depends. So that's, I guess, enough about me. I'm actually, actually also curious about you and about your background, because, yeah, depending on uh, what, what you talk about today, you will see whether this is a good match. So. Maybe Anton, you could put some um, one-liners in the chat and then people would kind of sign in with a one or something like that just to get an impression of what kind of audience I'm talking to. So who of you is using simple, plain Spring Web? That's Spring MVC, right? That's Spring MVC, exactly. And in a dependency, so when you would include the jar, it would be called Spring Web, indeed, Spring MEC. Uh, I used to use that. OK. To be honest, yeah. I would assume that most of you use Spring Web. So OK. Yeah, people are coming, uh, responding with pluses. Yeah, so nice. there they are. Plus them up. Minus. <laughs> <laughs> all kind of variations of plus also and okay cool that works so indeed we um, so far so good 
And let's see kind of more variation we have in, in spring uh, in spring land in terms of usage. So who of you is who is using spring spring webflux? Reactor webflux, so the reactive part of spring. So maybe also one liner for this one. So are you reactive, folks? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. okay. Uh, there also, are some, uh, but quite more minuses quite this time. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is perfectly understandable. <laughs> okay, cool. Then for my friend, yeah. <laughs> for your poor friend, maybe. Okay, nice. Um, yeah, so and this would actually be my third question. Who of you is using spring with coroutines? And I'm not going to say webflux, just spring with coroutines. We'll look at that also in the presentation. Flavors we have there. So spring boot with coroutines. All right. Well, yeah, I, okay, I assume okay. there are a lot of, and uh, I hope they're using coroutines. I also, I hope it's for them. For their peace of mind, for their sleep, for their well-being. <laughs> okay, I see a big plus. Yes, nice. Yeah, cool. Well, but I see not also all of them. That's fine. That's fine, right? So maybe we can give them some ideas today to switch. Cool. And then the very last question would be: Who of you is using Spring Boot with virtual threads in production? And to be honest, I do not expect almost no pluses. Well, for that, you need to have Java 21. Exactly. Right? Yeah, we talk about that indeed in a minute. Oh, OK. I see quite a few pluses. That's uh, OK. Uh, people, people are on the bleeding edge. Yeah. Wow. What an awesome audience. So I hope they're still going to learn something new today. <laughs> I will do my best. I will do my best, definitely. OK, but of course, I also would expect many minuses because this is new stuff. Many companies kind of also limit the way of using new GVMs. Depends a bit on your policy. It can be quite a hassle to, uh, to get new GVM version production. OK, I see quite teach this. OK, yeah, then you've got a good teacher, definitely. Excellent. Perfect. So I think I get a good idea what you're up to. So I think we have, in terms of the first three questions, it's it's bit evenly uh, distributed, but then for the last one, um, not anyone is using these yet. Okay, so last time we extensively looked at coroutines, a web flux, web, why you should do it. And for the ones who were not there, I think it's valuable to do a quick recap of what we covered there. So quite crisp and short. So if you want to have the long answer, I would advise you get a look at the talk at the uh, webinar we did uh, some months ago. So why should you use something like coroutines in Spring Boot? The big why, why should you do that? Well, this is an example which I will use throughout my presentation, which does some simple things. So we fetch some data, here a random avatar, we verify some email, and we assume we do this with some blocking remote call, and eventually we save some user in a database. That's always the case we're going to use in very different configurations and see how it performs, how it works, and so on. This example looks very straightforward. And what I tried to do is to put these different configurations side by side and kind of evaluate them what you get when you use such a configuration. It's definitely a simple configuration, right? I mean, the programming model we use here is very straightforward. It's plain Kotlin. There are no additional abstraction involved. It's kind of easy peasy, I think. And that's the big plus of this approach, simplicity. But how about efficiency? and fine-grade concurrency. And I'm going to right now show you some tests that will kind of make you fill in these items yourself instead of that I just tell it. Let's kind of prove it, what efficiency and fine concurrency, um, what impact on that would be. So what I've did, I've prepared this application, which does exactly what you see you just saw in the slides. So we fetch random avatar, where from email, here we use a blocking um, API call, the REST template, as you might know, know it. 
And on top of that, what you can do with this particular endpoint is we can also introduce a delay, an artificial delay. So when we call this endpoint, it will delay for the amount of time we configured here. And we'll see why this is important in a minute. So this application is started. I can um, call it and you see I get a response. I also kind of show you the thread which handle it because later on this will be important when we look at the virtual threads. Now let's look at the very important characteristics, which is the timing of this particular request. I have such a simple tool that, which gives me the time of this request. And with a delay of 200, which are configured here, I get timing of 400 milliseconds plus something, right? So I execute this many times, that's more or less what I get. Well, that's logical, right? Because what I do is I do two remote calls, one and two, they both take 200 milliseconds, adding up to 4 milliseconds plus a bit overhead for storing my user in the database. Right, that's why we get 4 milliseconds. So far, so good. Now, what we're going to do is we put this thing under load. So that's what you see uh, happening here. I have a command line tool that uses 100 concurrent users executing 110 requests. And instead of waiting only 200 milliseconds, now we wait two seconds. Two seconds. So what would you expect in terms of response time? Well, two times two seconds is four seconds, plus a bit overhead for storing our user. So the average should be, in an ideal world, something like four seconds, right? And let's see if this is going to happen or not. And if it's not going to happen, then of course we need to find a reason for that. And when we look at the result, this is really far from happening. This is the important portion of the, the stats. So the min response was indeed four seconds something, the min, but the average was 24 seconds, 24 seconds. So that's weird, right? So what happened here? Well, what happened uh, is something I explained last time. Um, because we have this long delay here and requests keep coming in and we have a fixed thread pool to handle requests, especially because we take a thread per request, at a certain point in, in time, all the threads in the pool are kind of waiting for replies of these services. So there are no threads left to accept new traffic. And that's why we get these very bad performance characteristics. So that's for the efficiency part. So when we put this on the load and when we have such a slow endpoint, then we are not efficient, not resource efficient. Besides, these two calls we actually could do in parallel. I mean, we could do that. They are not related to one another, so we could execute in parallel. And this is also something we cannot do. And that's why, if you look at this graph, we could say that um, it is not efficient. It doesn't allow for fine grade concurrency. So this is more or less what you get with Spring Web. It's a simple model, but from an efficiency point of view and also from a fine grade concurrency point of view, it's not a wonderful thing. Okay, well, the efficiency and the fine grade currency aspects have kind of been solved in Spring Webflux, where you would use then Reactor. So Reactor is the framework that allows us to do, um, well, reactive programming that gives basically these two characteristics. So now we have fine grade currency, we have efficiency, we're also more resilient, but the problem is simplicity will suffer tremendously. You can see it already in this simple example. You have these monos. Everything is a mono. Everything is wrapped in a mono. You deal more with monos than with kind of your domain you should work with. You get these weird operators, SID, flat map. You cannot throw exception. You have to wrap everything. So it's a very complex programming model. Your business intent is getting lost, right? It's about monos, not about what you actually try to achieve. And you also can shoot yourself very, very quickly in the foot. So if I do something wrong here, my performance will kind of die very quickly. And we got, I'm going to show you that too later in the presentation. And that's another limitation. We now have to use non-blocking libraries. So you can't use the blocking libraries anymore. Like for instance, especially for databases, relation databases would be the R2DBC driver instead of GDBC. It's probably the one that has the most impact. For REST and other kind of HTTP traffic, it's probably not such a big deal. But for databases, well, uh, RTBC has is a bit more uh, complicated than GDBC related frameworks. 
So this will be the spider graph for Spring Web Flux compared to Spring MVC. So you see, actually, it's kind of the inverse of the other, right? The one is simple, but not the performant. The other one is very performant, but not simple. And of course, it would be great if we had the best of both worlds, right? So we have frank concurrency efficiency with simplicity. And this is where coroutines come in. So how you configure this and how you should set this up was also in the previous summary, so I keep it a bit short here. Even so, I will do a short recap later on. The kind of magic is that you have to use Spring with Spring Webflux combined with coroutines. Then you have to start with Suspend. That's very important. We'll see what happens if you don't do that later on too. And then you also can do Async Await. So in terms of simplicity, well, it's quite simple. Right? It's still the sequential programming model we had in the first example with Spring uh, MVC except that we now can use async await, which is a very straightforward way of doing things. It's resource efficient, it supports parallelism, resilient, and so on. The only kind of limitation we have is the same like with reactive frameworks, we have to use non-blocking libraries. We can use blocking ones, and you'll see that too, what, what the impact would be, but ideally, if you really wanna get uh, decent, decent efficiency out of it, then you should use non-blocking libraries. So this would be the spider graph with Kotlin, Webflux, coroutines compared to the others. So Spring Webflux and coroutines really give us the best of both worlds. So to recap, with coroutines, we get these lightweight threads. We can write our logic synchronously, but it's executed asynchronously. That's the real big benefit of coroutines. Well, is it non-intrusive coroutines? Not really. So You've seen the suspend keyword that looks like a minor thing, but in that sense, it is not that minor because for instance, I cannot call suspend methods from normal methods unless the user unblocking, but we'll talk about that later on. So to a certain degree, coroutines are a bit intrusive. We have perfect structured concurrency and well, coroutines run on top of Webflux, so interop with reactive is just awesome. So if you use coroutines, what you get is hassle-free concurrency. Okay, so far so good. This was more or less what we talked about in the previous session in much more detail. Uh, we, show, we explained all the features. And of course, the questions today is, how about virtual threads? Where do they fit in? Are they complementary? Are they competing? Well, what's, what's, what's a virtual thread anyway? And all these answers I will try to give you today. And in order to, to do that, let's start really from the beginning. Where virtual threads come from? They come from Project Loom. Definitely you have heard from Project Loom. It's around for a long time already, so over six years now. And when you look at its motivation, it's very similar. It's actually identical to what coroutines try to achieve. Um, easy to use, high throughput, light to currency, for the GVM, the child platform. What you probably were not aware of is that Project Loom is not one thing. It's basically three things. So the first thing is virtual threads, what we're gonna talk about today. And the good news about virtual threads is that they're final. You can use them in production since, well, last autumn, they, they became final with JDK 21. And they're similar to coroutines. And then you have two other chaps, structure and currency chap, which is similar to coroutine scope, which we talked extensively in the last session, and scoped values, which we also talked in the last session, which is a bit similar to coroutine context. So it's not one thing. For now, we keep it with virtual threads. Later on, we're also going to look at these to give you a preview, to give you an idea where things are heading to, and then you can make up your own mind what you think of it. I will just provide you as much information as possible. The good news is because we looked at coroutines and kind of looked at all these aspects, we now also have a nice list to check when we look at virtual threads and maybe also the other Loom features we just seen. And of course, we start out with what are virtual threads. And a way to explain virtual threads is actually by comparing them to coroutines, because what we will see is that they're very, very similar conceptually. So from an implementation point of view, they're quite different, but conceptually, they're very, very identical. So 
when you have a computer architecture, at the lowest level, we all know we have the CPU. On top of CPUs, we have so-called kernel threads. And kernel threads are quite an expensive resource, so you can have only about 4,000 per gigabyte of memory. When you look at a GVM, those kernel threads are one-to-one -one mapped to um, platform threads in Java. So Java, Java thread is a very thin layer about the kernel thread. That's why threads in Java are so expensive. What coroutines actually do is it layer on top of platform threads, which is very lightweight. You can have 2.4 million coroutines per gigabyte of memory. That's a big difference, right? When you want to execute something on a GVM, you will need a thread. So also coroutine eventually needs to be executed by a platform thread, but it's not bound to it. So a coroutine can be executed by many platform threads and a platform thread can execute many coroutines. That's for coroutines. So how about virtual threads? So let's put them aside. When you look at virtual threads, I said conceptually are the same thing like coroutines. You can have millions of them in the GVM. But hey, also virtual thread eventually needs to be executed by a real thread, right? It's virtual, it's not real. In the end, you need a real vehicle to execute and do the job. But instead of using platform threads to execute a virtual thread, they introduced a new concept in GVM 21, which are so-called carrier threads. So carrier threads are dedicated threads, only a few ones, as many as you have cores by default, and they will execute virtual threads. And also here, they're not bound to virtual thread. So whenever a virtual thread needs something to be done, a carrier threads does it till he hits some boundary, kind of parks it, we'll look at this in detail in a minute, then executes another virtual thread. So really conceptually the same like with coroutines. And of course, also in GVM 21, you still have platform threads at your disposal. And we'll see later on why that is. I also get some really weird remarks of, of yeah, people I train also, also in conferences where the notion sometimes existed, well, from now on, only virtual threads will use own virtual thread for everything. Virtual thread can replace everything. It's going to be the new Valhalla. No, it's not going to be that. They definitely fill in a, a certain spot, but it's not going to be the Valhalla. And today I'm going to try my best to explain that. So let's dig a bit deeper and look at how virtual threads look like. This is a bit of Kotlin code where you create a normal thread. You have the thread builder here, which basically is a shortcut for new thread, new runnable run or start. When we create a virtual thread, that's the only difference. And when you look closely, what you see is that they both have the same interface, right? So from the outside, you don't really see that we're dealing with a virtual thread. It's just a thread. Kind of interesting. And this is a design decision which wasn't which was not made initially with Loom. So initially they had they wanted to introduce another kind of abstraction, fibers, they gave them different names. But later they chose to kind of stick to the thread interface. And we see that has quite a few advantages and some disadvantages. So just to again recap the difference between core teams and normal threads. Um, I have two snippets here. And actually, I ask you if you look at the first snippet where we create 100,000 coroutines, right? One to 100,000, launch, launch creates coroutine. We delay every coroutine for two seconds, then we print the dot, and then, um, well, eventually this program will be uh, terminated. That's what we do here. And here we do more or less the same. We create 100,000 threads. So, what do you think happens? in the first part and what you think happens in the second. And of course, they're going to execute it in real, so there is no, no much guessing going on. But actually, I'm curious just to also, um, yes. So example one, what do you think happens? And so example two, what do you think will happen? You can type it in the chat if you want. Here I have those examples. So this would be the coroutine example. Test. Mm 
Uh, some people okay. think there will be out, of, out memory. of memory. Very good, very good in example two, which implies, I would say, that example one just terminates without problems. Cool. And I think that nails it. Very good. So this takes about two plus seconds because, well, there is some overhead, of course, involved. Now we're going to execute many threads. And, well, we get an out of memory. The next question would be for the, well, uh, yeah, actually, I show you already. So after how many threads you expect this program to blow, assuming we have two gigabyte of memory, and you see it right here, I just nicely counted them, you get 8,000 threads. And that is logical because we saw in the presentation that you can have about 4,000 threads per gigabyte of memory. And because you have two gigabyte of memory, we get about 8,000 threads. So this example already showed in the, in the previous presentation. And now, of course, the, the, the interesting question is what happens if we do the same with virtual threads? So we used the exact same code like in the thread example up on top here. So we use a sleep, right? Sleep. But instead of uh, having a normal thread, we use a virtual thread. So what do you think would ex would happen in this particular example? And I see uh, smart remarks. So, <laughs> so indeed, uh, here you would get first. Um, you get actually indeed print line. If you want to have a first print line, then you you would have to move it to one up. But well, that that's something we also discussed last time with Spamat. So virtual threads take about plus plus seconds to execute, and I guess this is going to be correct. So two plus seconds, 100,000 virtual threads. Very good. So you're still with me. Great, cool to see. So what's apparently fundamentally different here is that the sleep method apparently does not block a thread anymore, right? Otherwise, we would have the same situation like on top here. So here, something different happened, probably the same thing like with delay, so that the thread that executed is not kind of blocked, but it's kind of suspended, parked, give it a name. So we can say that virtual threads are definitely lightweight threads. So we can tick that box. OK, now comes the cool thing about virtual threads. This is really cool. And again, to recap, let's first look at the limitations we get with coroutines and reactive programming in general. So it's not only a limitation for coroutines, it's just a limitation with, core, with uh, reactive programming in general. So what you should use with React programming coroutines is you should use new I.O. when you do I.O., so asynchronous libraries. And why is that? Well, you don't want a thread to be blocked. So the platform threads that execute those coroutines, they should be free. They should never block. Whenever you hit some I.O. boundary, they just should go back to the pool and, and take on new work kind of an event loop where a lot of work is scheduled. And when um, a thread executes work from this event loop, it doesn't want to be blocked because it's there just to, to execute a lot of work. Sometimes you have to use blocking libraries because, well, they are out there. And maybe you also make some native calls which are blocking. Then in this particular case, you have to ensure that you have a dedicated thread for that. And in quarantine land, that's also what I showed in last presentation, you should use the dispatchers IO, probably heard of this one, or another thread pool that you can dedicate to be blocked. That's basically how you solve this particular problem, which is not very resource efficient, but it kind of works. The cool thing with virtual thread is this one. They took all those kind of outdated, old fashioned APIs, Java IO, Java to concurrent, which were blocking by nature. And they kind of retrofitted them so that whenever a virtual thread calls those libraries, that the underlying carrier thread wouldn't be blocked. So the carrier thread would be suspended and later on uh, resumed similar to coroutine. So also here, these carrier threads just keep on spinning. Except that it's a bit safer as long as you use these Java IO, Java Util concurrent building blocks, which most libraries are built up on, right? So GDBC, for instance, is fully based on Java IO. Um, it's kind of hard to do things wrong here. In the core team, uh, reactor example, if I forget to do that, I get dire consequences 
but you don't receive any compiled code. You often see it in production when it's too late. Whereas here, the chance that you make things wrong is much, much smaller. However, there are two um, ex um, exceptions to the rule. The first one is that whenever you call a synchronized block, these carrier threads, they are pinned. That's, that's the, the lingo they use. So they will pin carrier threads. Meaning this carrier thread is not available from something else, so this carrier thread will block. And the same is true for native calls. So when you make, you have some native driver and you would use a virtual thread for that, this would pin the carrier thread. And this is something you should avoid at all costs because carrier threads are very sparse, one per CPU. So that's why platform threads are still needed for these kind of scenarios. And that's why also many frameworks didn't support virtual threads right away because also in Spring Boot, internally, they still used a lot of synchronized block to, well, make sure that everything is consistent. So they had to rewrite a lot of their code base to use the more modern building blocks of Java to concurrent, the locks, probably, if, I don't know if you've, if you've uh, used these blocks, so that they can avoid using synchronized so that carry threads are not pinned. So for me, this is really kind of the perfect Back to the future scenario I've seen in real life where some old crappy stuff all of a sudden gets a tremendous revival and kind of performs as good as a way newer and more complex complex stack. Okay. <laughs> cool. Should be printed and keep at developer desk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so just to summarize. I have here two samples, especially for this, your spring. I assume many of you have a lot of Spring Boot experience. That's what I also checked in the beginning. So you know the REST template, you know the web client. And in recent years, it was kind of advised to use the web client instead of REST template with virtual thread. That's not true anymore. If you use the REST template like you did before, that's just fine. It performs as good as the web client as long as you use this REST template with a virtual thread. That's kind of amazing, right? I still think this is amazing. Also a bit hard to believe, I would say. But of course, I'm going to show you. So how do I kind of use virtual threads in Spring Boot? In the beginnings, Anton already said it, uh, you need to have GDK21. That's not enough. You also need to have Spring Boot 3.2, the latest version. Before that, it's not supported. So that's a prerequisite. Then you have to use this system property in your applications property YAML, spring threads virtual enabled true. And then you basically can enjoy virtual threads. This is what you're going to do right now. So here's my application properties. I have this still set to false. That's why we got these terrible performance figures. So I say true. Oh, I got a safety thing. Then I have a Spring Server that should automatically restart itself. Ta da! Magic happens. And what we're going to do now is we're going to execute this exact same load test again. So we're going to call the exact same endpoint. This one we called in the beginnings, but now with virtual threads, and then see what happens. And before that, well, what do you think will happen when we call it with, so, okay, let, let's just go step by step. So the first thing I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to make a call so that you really know that it's a virtual thread now. Curl blocking. So the thread we receive here, you see thread, it's a virtual thread. So apparently, Spring really use a virtual thread to handle this particular request. When we do a single call with 200 milliseconds delay, we expect again, well, 400 milliseconds, right? Plus something. Just warm it up a little bit. So it's 4 milliseconds plus something because we do two remote calls, each 200 milliseconds, add that to 400 plus with overhead for persist your persist in the database. So far, so good. So from that perspective, they're really identical, these configurations. And now we're going to run our load test with, again, um, 
100 concurrent users execute 110 requests with a delay of two seconds. So we expect an average of four seconds. And look at that. We managed to do that. Right. So this was the normal thread um, example. So with that word thread, this is the word thread example where we see that on average, you now really get these four seconds. If this still sounds a bit like magic, I'm going to now take you through the whole process where I hope you where I hope you'll be able to clarify what happens now in the GVM when we use virtual threads. So when we get a request, we use a virtual thread for every request. That's something you never did in, in normal situations. You never had a dedicated thread you would spawn and hand to handle a request. It's kind of that was insane. With virtual threads, that's fine. So you'd simply spawn a virtual thread for a request. Well, we've seen that the virtual thread itself is nothing. It's virtual. It needs a carrier thread to execute it, to, to, to have it executed. So what happens then is we have this hidden um, carrier pool. As I said, this pool is kind of a given of the GVM, it's something you can't access. It's just there. So a carrier thread would be mounted. That's the term they use, would be mounted. Um, so the virtual will be mounted on a carrier thread, and the carrier would then execute the thing. Whenever this carrier thread hits an I.O. boundary, so here we do a remote web service call, then the following happens. First, um, so-called yield continuation would be called. Continuation. Something you might have heard with coroutines too, continuation. What happens then is that the virtual thread stack, so the stack of the virtual thread would be so-called unmounted to the heap. That's the word, term they use. And I used this uh, parking sign because this virtual thread would be, then be in the parked state. Like you park it just in a heap. And of course, because we are waiting here for a reply, the, the carrier thread can go back to the pool and take on new work. Then we get a reply from this web service, then submit run continuation would be called, and then of course the reverse happens. So we, um, we mount the virtual thread from the heap back. We um, again mount the carrier thread on a virtual thread and execution continues. We hit another IO bound, in this case, we do a call to a database and the exact same thing happens again. So we unmount it to the heap and get a reply. We mount it again up until our pros, our request has been computed. And once our response has been written, the carrier thread that handled it would go back and the virtual thread would be discarded, garbage collected. This is what happens in a virtual thread case. So what we mimicked here is that we had a resource that became slow. With the two seconds, we mimicked the resource that became slow. And we saw that this wasn't a bad thing because the underlying carrier threads would never be blocked. This would just be an unparked or would be a parked virtual thread that just waits there until a reply would be sent, but no thread resource would be wasted. So our system just continues to function and our users will be happy because, well, we can't have a situation where all of a sudden our thread pool would exhaust and we are not responsive anymore, not able to handle new requests. We haven't really talked about parallelism yet, right? And we will look at that in a minute because that's interesting. So when, we, when you look at Spring Web combined with virtual threads, you get basically this. We still have, of course, the straightforward program model. You don't even know using a virtual thread. You just use the same code like before. Really not a change at all. And now we get resource efficient efficiency for I.O. bound work. So our efficiency has increased quite a bit. And it's not fully, and I will show you in a minute why that is. There's a question, how long does the carrier thread wait to unmount a virtual thread? Um, well, I said there is an event loop going on where these carrier threads are spinning continuously and just work is kind of put on the, on the, on the work queue. And when it hits an IO boundary, it just does the unmounting and then it takes just on new work. So actually this happens immediately because these, these carrier threads should be spin continuously. That's more or less how it works. 
So these are advantages, but fine grade concurrency, we have talked about that. So parallelism, that's one thing I can do with fine grade concurrency. Well, we can't do something parallel yet, right? That's for one, but there's also a second one. If we have CPU bound work, virtual threads won't help us much. And that's also the advantage because I now cannot just switch to a platform thread easily. So once I start my request with a virtual thread, well, I'm kind of stuck with my virtual thread. And this brings me actually to another kind of um, big question. What is actually the difference between IO bound work and CPU bound work? Maybe you know that for you it's a given, but I found that in practice, many people still struggle uh, to, differenti to differentiate the two, especially when it comes to what is the impact on threads when, it when, when you look at IO bound work and CPU bound work. And I think it's valuable to take a look at that. So this would be the difference between the two. So with virtual thread, we get a bit more efficient, a bit more, quite a bit more efficient usage. For the rest, everything stays the same. So now let's compare CPU bound versus IO bound work. When you have IO bound work, this means actually that the task at hand mostly depends on input and output. This could mean th things like remote REST calls, query database, reading, writing files. But also if you do a thread dot sleep or you would use a lock it has kind of the same implications. It means that the thread is not doing something. It just sits there and waits. That's basically what it means. And that's why I try to mimic with my wheel here. So sometimes it spins well when it gets work, but then it waits again for IO. It spins, waits for IO. When you look at CPU bound work, this means that we are crunching numbers. So the CPU is continuously spinning. And that's work you mostly see in these areas, cryptography, complex algorithms. For instance, training an AI model is heavily CPU bound or even GPU bound, right? They use GPUs to train those models that they have massive parallelism. But here, the thread is actually constantly spinning and using the CPU. Virtual threads are really great with IO bound work because, well, a virtual thread does something, it hits an IO boundary, then it kind of is parked, unparked to continue. But the underlying carrier thread kind of can continuously spin. So it just, all these virtual threads, they put their work on the queue, and this carrier thread just keeps on spinning, 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 spinning. So that's why you get actually the resource efficiency. When you look at core routines, they are very good at that too. So core routines are also lightweight threads that do something, um, then they suspend, later they're resumed. And the underlying thread that executes the core routines is spinning continuously too. So when you have IO bound work, virtual threads are really great. When you have CPU bound work, well, that's not what you want because CPU bound work would kind of block this particular carrier thread. So this carrier thread cannot handle other virtual threads. And that's a kind of an interesting message for core routines. Core routines are more flexible. So for core routine, you can say, I use a certain dispatcher where I dedicate a thread for core routine task. So core routines can also do CPU one work quite easily. You just use a certain dispatcher a set with a dedicated thread. Okay. So, and if you still want to make, if you have, if you have CPU bound work on a GVM, but don't have core teams, well, then you need a dedicated thread to do that. So you see, virtual thread is not a remedy for everything. It is very good at IO bound work, where you have a lot of parking on park. So threads that do a bit something, then they wait again, then they do again uh, something. For these kind of scenarios, they're really wonderful. But when something needs to spin continuously, this is not the right tool for the job. In conclusion, we still can say that virtual threads are totally non-intrusive. Uh, in core routines, we saw that with suspend keyword, there are some limitations. You kind of will recognize in your code that you cannot just put it everywhere. But virtual thread is a kind of, when it's there, it's there. So it's totally non-intrusive. Even so, it's not that flexible. So you cannot easily switch again to a normal thread. Okay, and should you now have applications that do exactly what it did before, which are so-called thread per request methods? So the ones in the beginnings who said, I'm using Spring MVC, for you, virtual thread is really an awesome thing because you get all these three flags covered here. 
which is also one of the goals of Project Loom. So these are the goals of Project Loom, at least for, for virtual threads, where they say for simple thread per request style application, you get near optimal hardware utilization. And I call this efficiency, right? You get efficient resource usage. And it should be mostly used for existing code. So if you have your existing Spring MVC application, it will be much more resource efficient than it was before. And it's really a matter of putting this true flag in and off you go. But of course, we are not there yet, right? There are still some two more items to cover. And these are the more advanced thing. This is basically zooms in on the question this particular person has, like how about parallelism? How about structured and currency? How about reactive streams? How does this kind of uh, fit or is combinable with virtual threads? Okay, so let's first look at this structure concurrency. And structure concurrency is an awesome thing. Maybe many of you know what it is, maybe some don't. So I will give you an illustration what you can do with structure concurrency, not with code, but on a conceptual level. You will see code later on, no worries. So with structure concurrency, you can enjoy a variety of things. First, first of all, you can have structured parallelism which means that here I launch a process, which launches another process, which launches again many processes. So you get a whole hierarchy of processes. And the parent process knows when all the, sub, uh, the child processes have been completed. So it's structured. If you do this with threads, so when one thread starts another thread, the thread that was started has no relation to the original thread that started it, right? It's kind of, it just runs for itself. But here, everything is kind of aligned and synchronized. What you also can do with concurrency is what you've seen before, async await, so kind of async task. Then I set out three parallel tasks. I say await all, and then depending on in which order I will receive them, maybe receive B first, then C, then A. Once I have all of them, I can continue. So it's very easy to set out work, kind of, um, well, fan out and fan in kind of scenarios are very easy to accomplish with this particular feature. And coroutines just have this available. This is a bit the basics, but you can do even more cool stuff. So what you can do is so-called structured cancellation. So imagine we have this process tree. Now what I can do is I can cancel one of these sub-processes and then cancellation will kind of propagate to the children. That's again an awesome thing. With threads, that's just a horrible... Uh, really an, a big endeavor to accomplish. You just would say parent cancel and then it would cancel all the children. Or you say, okay, I want to cancel all except this children. You have fine grain control what you want to be canceled. What you also get, which is awesome too, is structured exception handling. So if an exception is thrown from a sub-process, the parent process can catch it, right? That's again, in threading world, that's impossible. I cannot just have a thread that I spawned that throws an exception that the, the outer thread would kind of ca capture, impossible. But with search concurrency, you can. And, well, to culminate it to, to, the, to the, the, the full beauty, you also can combine cancellation and exception handling. So I, by default, if I throw an exception, don't catch it, it would kind of propagate to the top. And from there, the top would ensure that everything beneath would be canceled. That's how default behavior works. And of course, you can control this to the finest level. So I can say, okay, I just want this sub process to be canceled and the rest stays alive. A full control over that. And also all these features are just available with Kotlin coroutines. This is what structure and currency is all about. This is basically, yeah, um, a parade of what you gain with structure and currency. And because coroutines have this, that, I guess that was also a bit of motivation for Loom. I don't know for sure, but I can imagine Java wanted to have that too. What we're going to do now is we're going to quickly take a look at how Loom tries to achieve structured concurrency. And this is on the construction. So in these slides, I had this ugly frame here just to make you very aware this is still incubator stuff. It's just to get, get a feeling, get a bit to know where they're heading to. Because I think that's also valuable, but it's not something you can use in production, which basically brings me to these two features, the structured concurrency chip and the scope value chips. You can try them out, that's fine, but you would need to have these flags when you start your GVM. Then you can play with this stuff. So 
Um, this would be an example of cryptocurrency in Kotlin. I have a court in scope, I launch two processes, and the scope would kind of magically ensure that these processes are finished before the next one would be executed. So by doing so, by just giving structure to my code, I can very easily handle many asynchronous tasks. Now, don't be shocked. Try to squint a bit. This is how this would look like in Java with the structure concurrency JEP 428. So Java would rely on the so-called structure concurrency scope. And with the scope, you would then fork tasks. And then you also have to call join and throw it fails. And if you forget that, well, I don't know what the way it would be. And of course, you have to do exception handling. So it's definitely not an as elegant experience as in Kotlin, but as um, conceptually, it's the same. Then let's look at async await, right? In Kotlin, you can do async, and then you can say await, await. See a good comment, yeah. Not there yet, by a mile, eventually we might end up with a bridging line which underneath uses child concurrency concurrency. Exactly, yeah. That's what I that's what I uh, think too. So I, I just give you now an uh, overview, and then I also guess once this stuff is final, Kotlin might reconsider certain things, optimize things. That's definitely possible. For now, let's just keep it what what we uh, yeah what we end up with when we use structured currency as it is now. So if you want to do async await, Java of course is very concerned with backwards compatibility, and they were looking for a construct which they already had, so they don't have to introduce a new one. And they found this old-fashioned, ugly future, which was kind of a no-go zone um, because it blocked, right? So this future had a dot .get method, and this got .get method blocked. Later on, we had a completable future, which had a nice map of lab map method or something, something similar, so which didn't block, but this future blocked. But with virtual threads, well, it doesn't block anymore. That's the beauty of virtual threads. So now all of a sudden this old fashioned future behaves in a non-blocking way. So they try to reuse that. So this is how you do async await with structured concurrency. Now, what you also get is cancellation. So you could say R2 cancel, but that's not the same like the cancellation you get with coroutines. So for instance, what you cannot do in, in core teams, what you can do is I can exclude tasks from cancellation. And that might sound like, well, is it a big deal? Yes, it is a big deal. For frameworks, sometimes you need to clean up certain resources. So you also want to exclude certain parts from cancellation. And this is not supported by Project Loom. And they know that this is not a great thing. So this is a comment on the Loom side itself where they say, well, now it's based on thread interruption because I said virtual thread is the building block beneath. So they have to kind of go with the constructs which are in there and to kind of stop things with threads is with interrupts, right? This is how you stop stuff with threads. So they had to kind of have to use this limitation to make cancellation, which is of course not as feature-rich as coroutines where you just can design something poorly to your need. So the backwards compatibility aspect here kind of hurts. So you see, we might propose to do so in the future to do and have an automatic mechanism. Even so, I, I think that's going to be quite hard because yeah, how are you going to do that? Challenge. The last one is also very intriguing, which has to do with context propagation. So what we see here in this simple example is we put the MDC, a diagnostic context used for logging. You might have heard of that before. And the problem with MDC is that they're bound to a thread local, right? They're bound to the thread. In coroutines, you actually don't know in which thread a coroutine is executed. I mean, depends, of course, what kind of dispatch you use. But if you just have um, some dispatches, you don't know which thread executed. So you might lose state of thread locals. But coroutines have this, mut this beautiful thread context. <coughs> Sorry. I have to drink. Talk a bit uh, too much. <laughs> So um, they have this beautiful thread context element. <coughs> Sorry about that. Poo. Um, which ensures that um, context of a thread local can be propagated to a new to a thread that executes 
not a coroutine. So this would be this MDC context element. <clears throat> and for this, Java kind of came up with a total new solution called scope values. And these scope values work as such that you create the scope values, then you have this where clause, and within this lambda here, I could use this particular um, scope value within all the um, forks I spawn in this particular um, lambda body. So that sounds like a great idea, but well, also here, this is not really backwards compatible with how frameworks work now. I'm really not a fan of thread local, but many frameworks out there use thread local. So to kind of retrofit this in, mo in modern frameworks, that's going to be a challenge in task two. How about reactive streams? Well, the structured currency chap has no idea, notion of reactive streams. So for these, you still would have to rely on a reactive or async framework, which is out there. So for instance, here are some examples. Flux would be the, the building block for Spring Web, Multi for Quarkus, Flowable for Vertex. So for the Java people, that's probably a bit annoying because well, you get to a certain degree with um, structured concurrency, but for virtual thread, you have to still use these libraries, which come with their primitives. I'm also curious how they kind of try to bridge these two worlds together. The good news for Kotlin developers is that, well, we have flow, right? And the nice thing is that all these primitives very easily convert to flow. So once you learn flow, you're actually done with Kotlin. Okay, so let's just quickly recap that. And then we're going to also look at how you can use uh, virtual thread with the, the, the perfect way. This is how we're going to end up. So we've seen that this truck scar code has some limitations. It's not really nicely um, combinable with thread local. So things like transactions, security context, and so on won't work that well. You can propagate thread local state yourself, but that's a hard thing to do. The scope values, we'll see how this turns out, but all the frameworks out there need to be quite intensively rewritten. So I'm curious how it's going to work. And what's also important to realize is that, for instance, transactions in Spring Web or Spring MVC, they are not thread safe within a single request. React transactions are thread safe. So if you would have multiple of these scopes and you would do the same thing in the same transactions, you run into problems with your framework. So also there, there's incompatibility. It's maybe in a detailed corner, but you can shoot yourself quite tremendous in the foot if you're not aware of such things. And we also seen that cancellation is limited. So what would be my verdict for now? And then we'll see how it develops. I think for simple parallelism, async await, um, for, especially for Java developer, that's really a big win, right? So now they have to use basically Reactor, which is much more complex. Later on, they just would use this uh, structured task scope, do some stuff in parallel, and most of it would work, except maybe from the thread local part, but we'll see, maybe they solve it. For Kotlin devs, it doesn't really matter because we have coroutines anyway, so we don't have to rely on that. Structured currency in Loom is definitely inferior to coroutines because it has more limitation. It is bound to the thread API, which is just not as feature-rich as coroutines, which were, were redesigned from scratch. So cancellation, state propagation, also syntax coroutines, yeah, will be better. Thread frameworks need to be adjusted, especially with the scope values and reactive streams. You still have to rely on libraries. So you see, there are really some cool things, but there are also quite some big questions how this will be integrate with the landscape we have today. So through concurrency with virtual threads, or at least with Loom, I'm not that enthusiastic yet. Maybe it changes, but for now, this is the conclusion. OK, so last but not least, how can I combine then virtual thread with my core teams, right? Because we've seen the core teams already do a very good job, but maybe they can do even a better job when we combine them with virtual threads. And I really love to, to um, show you again the wrong way, the way you shouldn't combine coroutines with Spring Boot, like I did in the previous part, because I see this happening all the time again, and people run into problems because they do it like that. Quite quick. So the wrong way, as you might remember from last time, if you've joined, was this. So if you use Spring Web, see this is not Spring Web, look, it's Spring Web, and you have normal methods, fun, so not suspend fun, but fun, 
And then you say, okay, I want to call coroutines. How can I call coroutines from a normal method? Well, um, user unblocking. And we seen that last time, don't do that. And you will see again why you shouldn't do that. But now you might think, okay, wait a minute. Last time I kind of got it, but hey, virtual threads don't block, right? Everything is non-blocking. So run blocking doesn't maybe block at all. So maybe I, now I can use this stuff. That's what you might be tempted to think, okay? So let's see what happens if you go down that road. So this would be this endpoint. And what we try to achieve is actually make these two calls in parallel. Third concurrency of Java is not there yet. So yeah, maybe we can use coroutines to accomplish that. So I would say run blocking. And we make this a bit um, more extensive. So I also gonna lock some stuff because this is really be important. Start store user. And then here, basically, we're gonna add async calls, right? So you're gonna async the thing. Here we also, by the way, gonna lock something. So we say also uh, logger.info calling this. And then we have our async blocks. Of course, now we also need to do await. No async without await. Okay. And then, of course, we're gonna return the thing here. So you think, wow. I uh, implemented parallelism in Spring Web. Isn't this awesome? Right. So any idea what would happen? Maybe someone just to keep the brains active, even so it's maybe already a, a little bit late. So maybe just put it in the chat. See if, if, you, if you know what's wrong here. It feels like asynchronous blocking. Asynchronous and blocking in, in, in one place. Mm -hmm. And what would the consequence be? Well, basically, you wouldn't get any benefits. I think that assumption is quite quite correct. So let's see what happens. So I'm going to clear this a bit up. You need Webflux, that's correct. That's also what I'm gonna tell in a minute. But as I said, I'm gonna show you what happens if you think you 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 cut corners. So what we're gonna do now is call this particular endpoint with a delay of 200 milliseconds. Just let, let's call it. And you see it's a virtual thread that executes it. And now we're gonna time it and this is, the kind of annoying thing. So uh, I executed many times with a layer of two milliseconds, but it stays with four milliseconds. So apparently nothing parallel happens. I not get below four, millis four milliseconds, right? I can try it a hundred thousand times. I not get below four milliseconds. Why is that? Well, that's logical. So now a virtual thread executes this particular Code block. Then we call run blocking, and run blocking works as such that the thread that called run blocking would be used to execute the coroutines in here, right? So the first virtual thread would do an async, and then would call random avatar, and from there it would hit this I/O boundary, and it would be unmounted, right? It would go to the heap, so it doesn't have time to execute the second async call. Once it's finished, then it would do the second async call. So you get just Nice sequential behavior like before. Okay, then people say, by the way, let, let's just look what we logged here. So we logged here, start user calling these URLs. And what I also did is I had an MBC. So in the beginning of my call chain, I have an MBC asset which generates a number. So every request that generates a number. And you see that um, in all these calls, we have the same MDC. So apparently the thread local thing, so this MDC lives on the local, travels nicely. It travels nicely from the outer part to the inner part. That's kind of good, right? So now what people do is then they, they probably heard it. Um, let's say, let's call it dispatchers. And for now I use virtual thread. I'm gonna show you more about this in a minute. So for now let's do fancy and say, okay, let's use a virtual thread dispatcher. Let's enter the thing, say, okay, <laughs> now I really, I'm gonna, I'm gonna solve this problem. Let's wait till it's restarted. <laughs> 
Okay, then we're gonna execute the same thing again. And now what we see is, hey, we get our 200 milliseconds plus something. So now it seems like we are parallel. But when you look at the log statements, you see that the first one still has the MDC, but the second, it's empty, it's gone. So the state we had here, which is also true for transaction state, security state, all the important state that lives in our thread is just disappeared within here. So if you would check for security here, or you would, um, well, use the MDC here, it's gone. Well, there are ways around it, like you can't use this MDC context for the context, but then you wouldn't have transaction context and so on and so on. Plus, if you then would do something in parallel here for your database, your framework is not made for that. You would get threading issues, which of course you really do not want at all costs. So, well, this is the bottom line. So you can try to propagate context with these things. They are not even available. You can write them yourself, but not available because it doesn't make sense. So, well, the conclusion is if you use run blocking, the only way where it might make sense is when you kind of do maybe some async calls that do not need any context from the outside part, then you might do it. That would be a use case, but I'm sure that you can explain your colleagues <laughs> what you're doing here. And when they start refactoring and want the context in here that they think, huh, why is it not working? So the question of course is how you would do it the right way. And we have already seen how you should do that. Well, you should use coroutines. And that's quite simple. So you put these dependencies in the class path, you use Spring um, Boot Start of Webflux, and then you have to start with suspend. That's the real, the key thing. You have to start with suspend so that from the beginning of your call chain, you have basically, yeah, this reactor context kind of thing that ensures that no matter how many other things you do, all this context nicely travels. It's kind of hard to face them because the code looks so similar like the previous one, but the underlying um, stack and what happens is really fundamentally different. So this is how you should use coroutines in Spring Boot. So where do the virtual threads come in? Well, the cool thing about virtual threads is that it's a thread interface. So a coroutine has no notion whether it's executed by a normal thread or a virtual thread. It's just a thread for the coroutine, right? And this kind of um, fact we might use for our advantage with coroutines. So these are basically options you have. You can use virtual threads to process your requests. So reactor would rely on virtual thread rather than a platform thread. This would mean this, right? You just enable virtual threads for reactor. And what you also could do is use virtual threads when you make blocking calls. So here, that's what you just saw. This is what I did. So you can say execution virtual thread dot execute as court in dispatch, and then I get a court in dispatcher, which I can use in this wrapper here with context. So every blocking call that would be made here would use a dedicated virtual thread for it. So not kind of limiting all the other um, coroutines that are dispatched by the by another thread. Or of course, you can use both. I wonder if we will be able to start with the suspend function without Webflux for Spring to the context with the appropriate things inside. That's a good question. No. Um, when you try to use suspend function without Spring Webflux, it compiles, but when you call the endpoint, Spring says, hey, uh, class not found. So it really expects certain um, classes to be on the class path, so that's not possible. I also did, by the way, talked about it in, the, in my first um, webinar. There are some flavors. You can use pure Webflux and you can combine it with Spring MVC. So you can kind of mix the two, but in the end, when you use suspend, and you, you will need Webflux, no matter what. Okay, so to finish, let's see what kind of combinations we can choose and what would the impact be if we choose them. So which one do I have to choose? What's kind of the, 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 smart, the, smart, the smart thing to do? Which brings me to this controller. So this would be the nice courting controller, you see, which has um, starts with suspend, has transactional, uh, uses async await. And to start with, 
let's just see what kind of performance we get when we use it with the traditional setup. We're going to restart application sometimes. Auto restart doesn't clean out some stuff just to be sure that we have a clean, a clean state here. So what I'm going to do is um, I do the coroutine call timed. So you see, in terms of timing, we get really good, we get parallelism, 200 milliseconds with this coroutine endpoint. It's a core endpoint, not the blocking one like we had before. And it's a virtual, it's not a virtual thread that executes it. So let's let's also ensure that. So curl um, coroutine JQ. So it's a normal thread. You see, it's just a, a neo thread. And I put the thing on the load, but on coroutines with the exact same configuration like before, it's always the same thing. Two seconds delay, a hundred concurrent users execute 110 requests. Let's just heat up, warm up the GVM, and you will see that. Eventually, we get quite decent performance. Ooh, that was that was worse. <laughs> Normally, it should get better. <laughs> yeah, so in the end, I ended up often with about two seconds average, something like that. You see, if you can, that happen. Of course, it's demo effect. Yeah. Okay. So this is more or less what you get: average two dot one seconds. So this is the beautiful picture we see. We have true parallelism, nothing blocks. No matter how much load I put on it, I always get more or less the same average. Now we're going to do something um, nasty. So instead of using, these are non-blocking service calls using the web client. I can, I can prove you that. You see, we have here a web client, and we're going to do these, these remote calls uh, in with coroutines using suspend. Also explained this in the last presentation, so if you want to know more about that, Take a look. What I also create is I create the blocking counterparts of these services. All right, I have a blocking avatar service, and I can prove you that too. So let's go there, and you see here we use a REST template. See, not a web client anymore. Okay. So now we use blocking code, and here it's kind of evident that it probably shouldn't do that. But sometimes you're also not very aware of that use blocking code with core teams. That's a bit yeah, of the flaky thing, but let's see what happens if we do that. And it's also, again, a question to you. What do you think would happen now if you put this particular thing on the load? So we do this exact same performance test again. So with core teams, 202 seconds with 100 concurrent users. And you see that it already takes apparently quite a bit of time because before I didn't have to talk so long to get finally the result in the picture. I really should have chosen some elevator music because apparently here something goes quite wrong. But I think it's valuable to wait also to give you as a reminder that should you once have a non-blocking application where you block stuff accidentally it the picture looks really bad so first of all we have minimum four seconds so no parallelism and average is 15 seconds so our whole performance gain is just gone deteriorated so this is what you get when you call blocking stuff without um caution when you use coroutines the way you should solve that you might know that is is like that so with context dispatchers io that's how you should solve that. So you have dedicated threads to make these calls. And then everything works fine. So here, state will be propagated within async. And well, that kind of works OK, except that this thread pool eventually also might be exhausted, might, right? There is a chance. So if, if, if these delays would be extremely high, they might be exhausted. I think, for example, I show you here. Let's do this again. Then we switch to virtual thread to round up. So let's uh, call this again. It wasn't started yet. So I... let's see. So yeah, now apparently it's healthy. You will get more or less the same results 
like here. You, see, you get, again, these two something seconds because it's very hard to deplete this, this red pool. So this is also till now, this was the, just the normal approach or the, the advised approach to use when you did blocking stuff with coordinates, use a dedicated thread pool, then it should be fine. So now let's switch to virtual thread. And initially, we still simply do blocking calls. So we have our blocking services here, so no additional context and see what the impact would be here. So this should compare. Um, so this what we had last time, right? Without any precautions. Let's run it here. So now we have virtual threads that handle each request in a reactive way, doing blocking calls. And this is what you expect, right? We get four seconds. Why? Well, we don't have parallelism. When a virtual thread hits verify email, it can handle the second coroutine. But overall, nothing is blocked. So the underlying carrier pool never would be blocked. So we, we end up with four seconds. The only thing we kind of lost is parallelism. And if it then would, would, would um, want this to perform really well, then we should use with context virtual thread dispatcher. So now only virtual threads are used whenever you do some blocking operation. Let's um, do that here. See if it's restarted, apparently it is. So now we should get the two seconds back. Even so, we do blocking stuff within coroutines, and that's what we get. So when we do everything non-blocking, virtual threads do not add much, really. When you have all non-blocking APIs, where, uh, platform threads might even be faster because virtual threads introduce a certain amount of overhead. They used to be park on park and so on. So if you if your if your stack is truly unblocking, there is not a real reason to use virtual threads. However, if you use blocking stuff, well then that's what you see here. Virtual threads are probably a good way to choose. Which brings to my conclusion of the webinar. So what can you do with the knowledge you have gained so far? Which actually brings you this question. So do you really need high throughput parallelism streams? Do you really need that? Because I found that even so it's fancy and cool and so on, many applications in this world, they don't have this high volume traffic and so on. Many applications I also written, they did have that. Some had it and there, this is where also used all this stuff, but some were just some administrative systems, which sometimes are highly complex, but not, they don't have a large load requirements of throughput requirements. So if you if you're in Java, well, just to also show you the, 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 yeah, the choice you have when you have Kotlin, when you have Java, then well, you just would use Spring Web. And ideally with virtual thread, because that's just a good thing to have. Because now when you do blocking stuff, it's non-blocking. However, if you if you really need it, then you have to use Webflux, which with all the complexity we just talked in the beginnings. With Kotlin, I would say the same. So if you don't need parallelism, high throughput and so on, stay with Spring Web and virtual threads and you're fine. It's okay. It's maybe not the fanciest, but it does the job. And if you need high throughput parallelism streams, then I would strongly advise you to use Spring Web Flux with coroutines. Then the next thing is, do you have some blocking code in these stacks, in, the, in these, in these um, in these applications. If you have, we've seen then, I think virtual thread is a good choice. If you don't have virtual, if you don't have blocking code in these applications, then I would strongly advise you do a load test, do a performance test to see what performs better. Because it might be that the overhead virtual thread introduce um, will not equate the benefit you get with them. So the, the counterpart would be, um, to use dispatcher IO, which would give you more threads, which would consume more memory, but they'll probably also be more aggressive, less overhead. So it's really a trade-off, which I cannot say, I think nobody can say, use this or the other. You have to test it. So after one hour, 20 minutes, still some more reserves. That's really great. Thank you for that. <laughs>
this would conclude um, the webinar. Thank you, uh, Urs. Yeah, like people are still with us, still watching the stream. And uh, there was a, a good question regarding the slide, probably just a second before you talked uh, about this choice. Uh, if if we actually need uh, Webflux in this in in this context in this tree, uh, yeah. But I guess you you just answered it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, you have to use if you want to use coroutines in Spring Boot. So if you want to find grain concurrency, if you want to have truck concurrency with coroutines, cancellation, all these things, then you have to use Spring Flux with coroutines and not run blocking. Right. And there was this right. exception: you can use run blocking, but I said I would not advise you to do that uh, because you will lack context in asynchronous calls, and most people are not aware of that, and they run into problems. So then I would really go for Web Flux with coroutines. Yeah. Exactly. Well, one thing probably for me is that, uh, as you said, it makes sense to test, to load test the application to figure out which one you actually need. But it means that we already implemented the code, we already implemented the application, and we have made the choice kind of already. I think it, it's just an idea uh, that I had. Maybe if when you are designing the application and you can foresee how much of I.O. it's going to do. So if it's a microservice and uh, the request handling is going to take, you know, another call to another service, a database, uh, I don't know, maybe files even and so on. If you foresee that, then it means that uh, virtual threads are going to do some good stuff for you. It feels like it. That's correct. But the core teams do that too if you use async on a stack, right? They do exactly the same. Yeah. Good threat are just a bit, they're a bit less intrusive. You have to, they're more carefree in that sense, but they do that too. And especially when you have this scenario with Microsoft, sometimes you want to call things in parallel. If this is good from architecture point of view, it's a different question, but that's what I see many people do. They call stuff in parallel and then virtual threats again are, yeah, there are maybe good choice with coroutines, but then you actually want to have coroutines. Yeah, it, the, the, <laughs> in the ideal world, we would just you know write the application and it performs out of the box without all the exactly. trade offs we have to make and, and, and choices in the design. All right. Exactly. Um, well, uh, it was a, a, a long session, but it was a useful <laughs> session and uh, people liked it, it seems. Uh, so thank you, Urs, for this awesome content. And uh, I hope you. you you come back one day again with some new interesting stuff and stories. Sure. Uh, nice. So for folks in the chat, uh, give us a thumbs up and uh, say thank you to Urs and applause as well. And uh, stay tuned for the updates. We have some other streams coming soon and uh if you haven't subscribed don't forget to hit that subscribe button as well otherwise uh have a nice kotlin everybody yes thanks a lot guys and my apologies i couldn't answer all the questions i saw quite some by but yeah it's a trade-off but uh, it was really great to interact with you and thanks a lot for uh opportunity to speak and maybe see you at kotlin conf that would be awesome in a few months sure right cool thanks everyone Bye.